Hey everyone, my name is Ethan Lindenberger. I'm working with Vaccinate Your Family to try and bring you safe and reliable information around vaccines. Online research can be really difficult. The math and statistics behind scientific studies can be hard to comprehend, and because of that, it makes it really difficult to find the answers you need to big questions. You probably know what I'm talking about. It's like when you're on Facebook and you see two people arguing about a topic. They tend to get into the comments and start citing a bunch of sources and studies, asking where the evidence is from, and throwing out numbers everywhere. It's like two monkeys just throwing poop at each other, trying to figure out which one sticks more. And if you see these people arguing and bringing out statistics and numbers and citing a bunch of sources and you follow up on it, it can be really, really hard to pinpoint who's right because statistics can be very complicated. And even more than that, statistics and numbers and graphs around scientific studies and information can be easily manipulated, leading you down a false road to think something that is not true. This is definitely the case for vaccines. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls you could avoid about scientific research online some of the reasons why we're bad at understanding numbers and statistics, and finally, better ways you can communicate in the scientific industry about real facts and data. One of the most common points brought up about online research is a tendency for people to manipulate stats and data. It's one of those things that leads to a lot of confusion and can easily be done by changing parts of the graph, the titles, the numbers, and how the graph even looks. Arguments made online and theories and evidence for something can easily be skewed or misleading. So to understand all of this, let's start with how this happens in the first place. A good scientific graph has all the following. A clear data set with detailed sample sizes and how long the studies took place, explicit x and y variables, metrics on the graph that do not skew the information, and explanations for what the data means. These can all be individually changed to create a lot of confusion. For instance, if I change a data set to start on a different year, it looks like the means those cases have always been dropping. However, if we brought it back a little bit, we could see the spike when the outbreak occurred. These kinds of statistical manipulations can create fake conclusions and false logic. Outside of just physically changing the way information is presented, logic explanations for what it means can also be manipulative. Something is obviously happening in this graph. But when I reveal that this is the amount of people who drowned are falling into a pool, and the amount of movies Nick Cage appeared in, it makes a lot less sense. This is known as causation correlation fallacy. It's when you take two different data sets that are not related in some ways, but seem similar based on the pure metric value and claim that there's a cause between the two of them. With a Nick Cage and Pool situation, it seems like there's a trend. It seems like they're connected, but they're really not. This can happen in very, very meaningful ways that can lead you down a very bad road in statistical fallacy. Think about the rates of autism and the growing rates of vaccines. If you look at the changing variables and the amount the graphs change, it may seem like the growing rates of vaccines leads to more autism diagnosis, but actually it's not the case. Autism spectrum disorder has been on the rise in diagnosis because we understand the disease better. We know how to diagnose the disease in places when we weren't able to before. And with vaccines, we've increased the amount of vaccinations in different communities for the past 30 years, and that's going to correlate. It does not mean there's a cause, though. This reality of understanding ASD more and the growing rates of vaccines alongside scientific advancement can be known as a confounding variable. This is the variable that leads to the two different things to correlate in a similar fashion but not be caused by each other. The reason there's a growing rates of vaccines and there's growing rates of ASD diagnoses is the confounding variable of scientific advancement. That's the thing that's causing both those to move in similar trajectories. It doesn't mean that they're causing each other. It almost makes as much sense as claiming that autism is claiming high rates of vaccines. They're not related, even though they are, but in a different way. And this idea of logical fallacies actually is really interesting. We talked about how data can be skewed or manipulated physically to mean something different and can be interpreted in a way that means something different. But actually, the way we comprehend numbers also comes into play with online research. Logical fallacies like the one with the correlation causation can show us that the way we interpret data and numbers and science can actually be a little incorrect. It's because of our brains, it's not your fault. And for instance, something like the gambler's fallacy shows us how numbers can sometimes mean something different than what we think they mean. The gambler's fallacy is really simple. If I roll multiple six-sided dice, and I roll two sixes, for example, well, that's great, and if I roll them again, I'm not as likely to roll a six again. I'm not going to roll four sixes in a row, that's crazy. But because I rolled two sixes before, that does not change the next outcome. That's not at all how statistics work. The entire time I'm rolling those dice, it's a one in six chance for every single number. The past outcomes don't determine the future ones. This idea of numbers being a little confusing and not biologically registering in certain ways brings us to part two and a really, really interesting discussion about how our human brains comprehend statistics. If I ask you to imagine what a room full of 100 people looks like, you might imagine a large classroom. If I ask you to imagine what a 1,000 people looks like, you might imagine a small theater. 
If I ask you to imagine what 10,000 looks like, you might think of a stadium of some sort. But 100,000? Well, that would be like uh, the Super Bowl. And a million people gathered together in one crowd? It's almost hard to even imagine. Imagining a crowd of a million people seems impossible. I mean, that's the whole population of San Jose, California. What would it look like if that many people were there together in one place? This thought experiment actually shows us something very interesting about the ways that our brain registers very large and very small numbers. Beyond a certain extent of a numeric value, we rely on the imagery comparison phenomena. This is where our brain does not understand explicitly what the number means, so we have to tie it to some kind of image or some kind of understanding to even grasp at what it actually looks like. This is really important to understand because the way that our brain understands these very large or very small metrics closely ties itself to the online research we do, especially with stuff like risk assessment. When I say you have a one in a million chance of a vaccine injury, that might not actually make a lot of sense to you because at some level, your brain does not really know what a million is. How unlikely is one in a million? Well, because of the imagery comparison phenomena, I can actually explain it in a lot better ways by saying you are more likely to be struck by lightning than have a vaccine injury. That then registers as very unlikely and it's not going to happen to you. When one in a million is the same thing, honestly the same chance. But because of the imagery and comparison I'm showing you and the way that our brain understands data, it makes a different impact. And this imagery comparison phenomena leads us to our final point. Fundamentally, the reason I believe our brains focus on data like this is because we are not mathematicians at heart. We are storytellers. The ways that we understand scientific information is not through statistics. The way that we understand real information, real facts and evidence is through it happening to us because we have survived for millions of years off of examples that have demonstrated and fallen right before us. We see the anti-vaccine community do this very often where they rely on anecdotes and stories to convince people of things they believe rather than relying on scientific information. Well, because there is none, but also because it's just more effective. We lose this because in the scientific industry, we perceive anecdotes as less important, vital, or accurate. When if they define and back up the evidence we have, they are honestly more reliable than any study we could conjure because it perceives differently to human beings. Studies, numbers, and statistics don't mean as much to us as experience does. So the way we communicate better with scientific information is through the lens of storytelling. Storytelling that still backs up the studies and evidence we have, but can actually make a difference, can actually cause emotional reactions and get people to understand the impact of the action rather than the abstract of it. If I tell you that measles is a dangerous disease, but don't talk about the, the thousands and millions of children that have died from measles, it might not make as much of an impact, but those experiences are still very real. If I talk about meningitis survivors that lost their limbs to a disease we can vaccinate against, that might perceive like the disease is more dangerous than it ever was if you looked at a number. And if I tell you that sharing your story can make that difference, and that we need everyone to tell their story, and that everyone can make more of an impact than any scientist ever could if we all share the real experiences behind the data, I hope that makes an impact too. Because even if you got your vaccines and nothing happened to you, that's still a story. Even if you had a family member that lost their life to a preventable disease, that's still a story. Even if you have done nothing in your life, you've never gotten a vaccine, you have no involvement with this at all, and this is the first time you hear about this, then you're like me. You're someone who did not receive any vaccines growing up, and you can choose to do that now and share your story. You never know what the impact is before you do it. And we need everyone to support vaccines because we have the statistics, we have the data to claim they're the best ways to save lives. We just need your help. Thanks for watching.